It's a joy to be with you this morning. My name is Vody Bacham, and I bring you greetings from the city of Houston in the great Republic of Texas. And I um, just have to tell you, I have to give you forewarning, I am the worst kind of Texan. I am a Texan by choice. Yep, wasn't raised there, just got there as quick as I could. But um, I, I am a Southerner, and so I will, use some, I will use some Southern phrases and some Southern sayings over the course of uh, our time together today, because I, I am from the South. I was raised in a small Southern city called Los Angeles and, um, in Southern California. And um, so just, just be ready when those things, when those things come out. Um, it's always difficult to come into a situation like this, and we have looked forward for quite some time for being here and being with you. Um, first of all, my wife and I are always looking for an excuse to come to Las Vegas and eat our way through this city. Um, and so we, we, we always love doing that. And then um, her sister and our brother-in-law, uh, they live in Dallas, and so they came down to meet us and, and to help us eat our way through the city um, while we're here. And so we, we are excited about being able to be here. And, and to spend some time and, and, um, and just enjoy our time with you and our time in, in, in your city. And we're grateful. Um, but it's always difficult because coming into a situation like this, you, you, don't, you don't know me and, and, and I don't know you, although I have an advantage because this is now my fourth chance to preach to, to this community of believers. And I'm, I'm beginning to understand what hope is all about. And uh, I have come to appreciate this body of, of, of believers. And I hope this last service doesn't disappoint um but no i'm sure you i'm sure you won't but um and so i want you to understand where i'm coming from as i share something with you today about which i am extremely passionate there are two distinct sides of my life there's the, the one side of my life the professional side of my life where um i have the privilege of serving as a, a pastor and as a, a professor and specifically teaching in the area of cultural apologetics um, teaching Christians to know what they believe and why they believe it and how to communicate that effectively to a culture that is diametrically opposed to what it is that we believe. Um, and then there's the other side of my life um, where the rubber meets the road. Um, that, that side of my life where what I claim to believe and what I teach is tested and is tried um, and, and, and where it's either deemed to be true or false. And that is the place where I am Bridget's husband and Jasmine and Trey and Elijah and Asher's father and the father of all of the arrows yet to come our way. Um, and I say that and people always, you know, sort of grin at me like, for real? Um, yes. Can I just tell you that our passion, um, and it hasn't always been our passion, but our passion is to raise, train, disciple, and launch from our home as many children as possible. That, that's our passion in life. And again, it hasn't always been our, our, our passion. Um, and, and so, anyway, more about that later. But people have always asked about, you know, where these two areas of my life come together, this area of cultural apologetics and teaching apologetics and this area of family. Um, and they come together nicely because cultural apologetics is all about looking at our culture, understanding what our culture is trying to communicate and dictate to us, and responding to the culture from a biblical perspective. Refusing to buy the lies of the culture and knowing biblically why it is that we reject those lies. And if there's any place where we've been lied to by the culture, it's in the area of marriage and family and parenting. We've been lied to by our culture. And so because of that, we don't think biblically in those areas. Let me give you a few examples. One, we don't think biblically about marriage. We don't. We, we, see, we see marriage as something to be avoided, like the plague. And so the attitude of the average Christian family toward their children is, I want them to wait as long as possible before getting married. That's our attitude. That's the attitude with which our children grow up. Wait as long as humanly possible before you get married. Don't do it unless you just have to. That's our attitude. Bridget and I got married the summer between my sophomore and junior years in college. I had just turned 20 years old. I didn't even have a driver's license. I went and got a driver's license so I could get a marriage license so that we could get married, okay? And so because I was 20 and because I was still in college, there were people who cried because we got married. They cried. The Bible says a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. They cried because I found my good thing. 
Why? Because we believe marriage is a curse and not a blessing. It's horrible. It's terrible. Avoid it as long as you possibly can. That's what we teach our children. And so here's the attitude that we try to give to our children. We say, our sons, talking about my sons. Sons, here's what I want you to do. I want you one day, as far away from this day as possible, to look a young woman in the eye and say, I've sucked all the fun and joy out of life. Now I'm ready to marry you and die. That's what we're teaching our children to communicate. Have your fun, because when you're married, it's over. Enjoy life, because when you're married, you won't. Suck all of the joy and marrow and happiness out of life. Have all of the experiences you can. And then, if you must, get married and end it all. That's what we communicate. We're wrong on marriage. Because the culture's wrong on marriage. I tell my wife two things all the time. And if my kids were here, they would let you know what these two things are. Before they come, they, right now they'd be like, I know what he's going to really say. Because I say these two things over and over and over again to my wife. Number one, I tell her, I wish I was born married to her. And I do. I do. I regret the days that I didn't have the privilege of being Bridget's husband. And secondly, I tell her, if you leave me, I'm going with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And my attitude with my children is not, oh, wait as long as you possibly can. I want my children to marry as soon as possible. That's my goal as a father, that my children will marry as soon as possible. Not as late as possible, as soon as possible. And we hear that and it sounds foreign. Wait a minute, dude, are you crazy? No, I'm not. I'm Christian. Here's the thing. Talk to the parent of an eight or nine year old child and ask them, do you have any idea where you think you'd like your child to go to college? Of course I do. Do you have any idea what your child needs to do between now and then in order to get into the kind of college that you want them to go to? And are you doing anything right now in your child's life to prepare them at eight or nine in order to be qualified and ready when that time comes? Of course. When we chose the house that we live in, the first question we asked was about the schools. Everything we do in our children's lives is about preparing them for when they go to college. Great. Same parent, same eight or nine year old. Are you doing anything to prepare your child for their marriage? Uh, huh? It's amazing. College, we got it all mapped out and everything we do is geared toward getting into the right college. Marriage, they leave the house one day and we hope they come back with a good one. That's wrong, people. That's absolutely wrong. My goal is to do everything possible right now in my children's life to prepare them as soon as possible to be ready to take the mantle and be husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. That's what we're preparing them for. Because newsflash, my education is nowhere near as important as my marriage. And so we have to do cultural apologetics as it relates to marriage. We also have to do cultural apologetics as it relates to children. Because what's the culture's attitude toward children? A boy for me and a girl for you, and praise the Lord, we're finally through. <laughs> Amen. We mutilate our bodies in order to prevent having any more of them. Think about that for a moment. I know we never think about it that way, but that's what we're willing to do. That's what we're willing to do, and that's what we communicate to our kids. So I talk to young people all the time. The last thing they want is to be married, and the last thing they want is kids. Maybe one. That's what I hear. When you talk to teenagers nowadays, maybe one. Just because the biological urge, I'm sure, is there. And so I'll do it just to satisfy that biological urge. But maybe one. I don't want them to interfere on my life. The Bible says they're an inheritance and a blessing. What other blessing is there in the world where we say to God, God, please don't bless me like that anymore. I will mutilate myself in order to present you, prevent you from blessing me like that anymore. What other blessing is there? And have you thought about what we communicate to our children? You are such a burden that we were willing to do anything in our power to make sure no more like you came this way. That's what we're communicating. Do we mean that? No, we don't mean that. Of course we don't mean that. I hope we don't mean that. 
But ultimately, that's what we're saying. Talk to a pastor one time, and they, you know, they had the, the children. He said, you know, he, with my third child, his name is Miney. He said, what? Yep, eeny, meeny, miny. We ain't having no more. <laughs> Why is that our attitude? Why is it that we see a woman walking down the street with six, seven, eight kids? We look at her like she's got a third eye right in the middle of her head. Because our culture despises children and so do we. They're a burden and a blight and not a blessing according to our culture. And therefore, that's our attitude. We need a biblical apologetic as it relates to marriage. And we need a biblical apologetic as it relates to children. What does the text say? And why do we believe the culture and not the Bible? Why? Some of you are uncomfortable right now because we're talking about this stuff. Because we are so immersed in the culture that when we talk about these things from a biblical perspective, it's like, that's crazy. You spend less time listening to Dr. Phil and more time listening to Dr. Jesus. Can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. All right. Thirdly, and this is the third area, and here's where we're going to spend our time today, on this area of preparing training and discipling our children. We've believed the culture and not the scriptures. We've missed it in this area. And that's where we're going to spend our time. But look at where these things come together. Birth rates in our culture, for example, are at an all-time low. According to one writer in the New York Times, Michael Spencer, never before, except in times of world war and great famine, have birth rates fallen so low, so fast, for so long. Never before. Replacement rate in any culture is 2.1 children per couple. That means your culture is stagnant. People are just having enough kids so that when they die, they're not missed. That's all. 2.1. Culture's not growing. Culture's not dying. We're currently at 1.8, which means our culture is dying. We're having 1.8 children per couple. Now, we're doing better than a lot of the industrialized world. For example, in Western Europe, in France, in Germany, their birth rates are 1.5, 1.4. In places like Japan, somewhere between 1.4 and 1.2. Lowest birth rates in the world, in Italy. Somewhere between 1.1 and 0.9. The Italian government is paying people to have kids. Paying people to have kids. Because their culture is dying. Now, people don't say this. Actually, they do. But they use fancy, politically correct words for it. Has anybody heard the phrase, aging population? You know what that refers to? not having enough children. That means the number of older people who are not going to be here all that long is far greater than the number of children who will replace them. Our culture is dying. And that's what's happening all around the Western world. So what's the significance of that? Give me one example. In Germany, the Muslim population has a saying, Germany is ours, the Germans just don't know it yet. Why? Germans average 1.4 children per couple. The Muslims who have migrated into Germany average between six and eight children per couple, which means in Germany and in France, they will be Muslim nations within three generations by birth rate alone. Still think it's not an issue? Ever wonder why we're having such a financial crisis over Social Security? When the program started, there were somewhere around eight workers for every retiree. Now we've got more retirees than we have workers. Why is it so out of whack? We didn't have enough kids to make it work. Real life, rubber meets the roads, that's the issue. Well, couple this with the fact that now, among Christians in our culture, for the last couple of decades, here's been our track record. Somewhere between 70 and 88% of the children that we do have and raise in our homes are leaving the faith by the end of their freshman year in college. That's right. We have between a 70 and 88% failure rate in the Christian community in America at raising our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, of passing our faith on to the next generation. 70 to 88%, that's our failure rate. Can you imagine if General Motors had to make an announcement. Well, we're sorry to inform you that somewhere between 70 and 88% of our cars don't last beyond the time you drive them off the lot. General Electric, sorry to inform you, 
but somewhere between 70 and 88% of our appliances don't last more than a week in your home. They'd be out of business. The Church of the Living God, sorry to inform you, but somewhere between 70 and 88% of the children that were commanded to raise in the discipline and instruction of the Lord are not even involved with God's people by the end of their freshman year in college. Let's put those two things together, shall we? Birth rates at about two. Our retention rate, somewhere around 25%. That means, currently, it takes two whole Christian families in one generation to get one single Christian into the next. H hear that, folks. It currently takes two whole Christian families in one generation to get just one Christian into the next. Well, we better do a better job of evangelism because that means generation one is four million, generation two there's only a million. We better do a better job of evangelism. If evangelism was the only answer to this issue, we would have to reach three lost people for every one Christian. Currently, currently, the most evangelistic group in the country reaches one lost person for every 42 of them. The church in our culture is dying. In the decade of the 90s, 100,000 churches closed their doors, never to open them again. 100,000 churches died in the decade of the 90s. More in this past decade. That's what's going on. That's what's happening all around us. So what's the answer? I'm glad you asked. God has given us a mechanism for multi-generational discipleship. And that mechanism is the home. That mechanism is the family. Open your Bibles, Bibles with me and let us look at Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to examine Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 and look at this process of discipleship, at this process of passing on the faith from one generation to the next. Now let me warn you ahead of time. We are not going to have time to go through all of this. I am so sorry. Um, however, some of you already passed by our table out there and you saw this book out there and we're asking about it. Family Driven Faith, doing what it takes to raise sons and daughters who walk with God. This is the place where those two passions of our life come together. This is the place where cultural apologetics meets marriage and family and we talk about what's happening, why it's happening, and what it is that God has commanded us to do to reverse this trend. And so just know that that resource is available to you beyond what we're going to be able to go through today. But today I want you to look at three phases in our child's life, three phases that we're called to take our children through in preparing them to be launched into the culture for the cause of Christ. And hear this. If you're here today, and perhaps you're here and you say, well, you know, it's great you're going to talk about that, but I'm not even married, let alone have kids. Newsflash. If I was here talking about how you can get into college, would you sit there and say, please, I'm not even in college. No, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, because you want to be prepared for it beforehand. There are people in this room who are going to say, by the time we're finished, I wish, I wish I'd heard that 30 years ago. Guess what? You are the 30 years ago promise. You're getting what they wish they had when they were in your shoes. Don't miss it. Mom and Dad, if you have kids in that age bracket, let me give you a little bonus. This is bonus material. Because parents are just worried, just worried to death about, you know, whom their children will marry. And they're worried about their children's tastes. And we're just kind of, oh my God, please don't let her come home with a loser. <laughs> if you understand what marriage is for, and if you have a kingdom vision of marriage, and if you understand that we are raising an army for the cause of Christ, it changes what you look for in a mate. If you look at the culture's view, I just want somebody who's so fine that they make me happy. You look at the biblical perspective, yeah, you know, she looks all right, but she doesn't know the Lord and she doesn't want kids. I'm raising an army here. She can't help me. Get to study. It changes what we look for, folks. It changes everything when we understand the purpose. Perhaps you're here and you say, you know, this is great, but man, you know, you're 30 years too late. You're 40 years too late. Newsflash. This issue is so important and it's so crucial that we teach on it over and over and over again in church. 
that God has given us a principle, the Titus 2 principle. And we've heard this all the time, a Titus 2 man, a Titus 2 woman. But we stop short. We think, well, that's a Titus 2 woman because, you know, she knows the Bible and she teaches the Bible and she teaches doctrine, she teaches theology. Read the text. The Titus 2 woman is supposed to do what? Older women teach the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home so that the Word of God is not dishonored. Specifically, specifically, as the older women around here, it is your responsibility to sit the younger women down and coach them in motherhood and in being wives. That's your job, older women. So if your children are grown and gone, look at this two ways. Number one, I'm going to get this to my children so that they can get it to my grandchildren. And number two, I'm going to get this into myself so that I can take seriously my responsibility, my obligation as an older woman in the church to sit younger women down and train them and coach them in the areas of marriage and family and parenting. Amen? With that in mind, let's look at this text. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Can I just put a footnote here? The discipleship of the children is ultimately the father's responsibility. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5, the father is also responsible for discipling his wife. So this is what I tell young women. Unless and until you found a man who is spiritually mature enough to disciple you and your kids, you haven't found a man who's qualified to be your husband. Are oh, you smelling what I'm stepping in? It's one of those southern sayings I told you you were going to get today. Okay? Father's responsibility. To lead. You know? And so dad's responsibility. Yeah, I, I'm the head of this house. <laughs> Talk to me about this all the time. Guys, if you ever have to say, I'm the head of this house, you're not. <laughs> you're just not. You know, trust me, General Petraeus is not over in Iraq going, I'm in charge, man. No, he's not, he's not doing that. You're the head. You don't have to tell people you're the head. You just are. And being the head doesn't mean you beat your chest. Me man, you woman. Me say, you do. <laughs> Headship is spiritual from a biblical perspective. That means you are the priest, prophet, provider, and protector in the home. That means you set the pace spiritually. That means you set the pace in discipleship. That means you set the pace in training the next generation in the home. By the way, ladies, you're sitting here. And if right now you have an urge to elbow your husband and say, do you hear what he said? I told you to do Don't do that. Just, just don't do that. And when you get home, don't get home and, you know, say, you go out to the table and you buy the book. Here, you read this because you need to step up and you need to be the man and you need to leave this home. Ladies, can I help you understand what you do when you say that to your husband? You make sure that he's a loser no matter what. You guarantee the fact that your husband's a loser when you, when you challenge him like that. Here's why. If he does what you said, then you're the head, not him. If he doesn't, then you're still in hot water. So you've guaranteed that no matter what he does, he's a loser. Don't do that. Do you hear me, ladies? Stop it. Doing that is like tearing down your own house brick by brick. Don't do it. Allow me. Three phases we take our children through. Okay? Three phases we take our children through. Phase number one, the discipline and training phase. The discipline and training phase. All right? In that phase, here's the phrase they need to understand. Give me your attention. That's phase number one. Discipline and training. Give me your attention. Phase number two, catechism phase. Catechism phase. In that phase, here's the phrase. Give me your mind. Phase number three, Discipleship phase. The discipleship phase. And that phase, here's your phrase. Give me your hand. Phase one, all together. Discipline and training. Come on, one more time. Phase one, discipline and training. Phase two, catechism. Let's say it. Phase two, catechism. Phase three, discipleship. One more time. Phase three, discipleship. 
Phase one, discipline and training. Phase two, catechism. Phase three, discipleship. Phase one, give me your attention. Ready? Phase one, give me your attention. Phase two, give me your mind. Ready? Give me your mind. Phase three, give me your hand. Ready? Give me your hand. That's what we're going to talk about here. That's all we're going to spend our time on. These three phases. Understanding these three phases and how important it is for us to do this if we're going to train our children in righteousness and raise them up with a multi-generational vision of discipleship. Phase one, the discipline and training phase. Give me your attention. What do we teach our children in this phase? Look at the text. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. If I tell my child to do something and they don't do it, they just disobeyed, which means they violated Ephesians 6.1, which means they're in sin. So my children are supposed to do what I tell them to do. Pretty simple, right? Secondly, if I tell my children to do something and they don't do it when I told them to do it, that's delayed obedience. Okay? And there's a technical Greek word for delayed obedience. It's disobedience. All right? That's the technical term in the Greek there, all right? Delayed obedience is disobedience. So if I tell my child to do something and they're delayed in their obedience, that means they're disobedient, which means they're violating Ephesians 6.1, which means they're in sin. Verse 2 says, honor your father and your mother. So if I tell my child to do something and they do it, but their attitude is nasty, they've just violated Ephesians 6.2, which, by the way, is the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, which means they're in sin. So in phase one, my job is to teach my children to do what they're told, when they're told, with a respectful attitude. That's it. First few years of life, this is crucial. These are phase one years. First few years of life, teach our children to do what they're told, when they're told, with a respectful attitude. So when they're in their quote-unquote terrible twos, you know, Johnny, come here. No! No! And he runs away. Oh, aren't they cute at that age? No, they're sinful. That was sin. And if you don't correct it right now, you are coaching them to be sinful. Really? Yes, really. If you just say, because of your phase in life, I don't expect you to do what I say when I say it. You said, God's a liar. Because God said, they're supposed to do what you say when you say it. Amen, lights. Delayed obedience. Sin. By the way, I used to coach delayed obedience. I used, to, I used to train my children in the sin of delayed obedience. I didn't know that I was doing this. Because again, I didn't have all this stuff together. And a lot of people are going, you, know, well, you know, you can say all this stuff that's great, and I'm sure you've had that heritage, and you were raised that way, and you had this, and you had that. Think again. I was raised in the projects in drug-infested, gang-infested South Central Los Angeles, California by a single teenage Buddhist mother. The first time I heard the gospel was my freshman year in college. I didn't grow up with this. My wife didn't grow up with this. We didn't have this when we got married. We had to come to a Cortez moment, you know? Bring everybody out on the beach and burn the ships. We are not going home. I'm sorry, we ain't going home. Amen? That's what we had to come to, folks. And so we did. We, I just had it all wrong. I used to teach my children sin. Because all children are trained. They're either trained well or they're trained poorly. I used to train my children to sin. I taught them delayed obedience. How do you teach children delayed obedience? Well, one way you teach them delayed obedience is you tell them things over and over again. See, if I'm telling my child something over and over again, then I'm telling them, you don't have to obey me when I say. You just have to obey me eventually after I say it four or five times. So by repeating myself to my children over and over again, I was training them in sin. No, I tell you to do it. You don't do it. There's an immediate consequence. First time. How else do we train them in disobedience or delayed obedience? I used to do it through counting. I used to coach my children to sin. Trey, do that. So, one. Yeah. Two. I was coaching sin. Because what I was teaching my children was, you don't have to do what I say when I say it. You just have to do it sometime between when I say it and when I get to three. I was training my children in sin by counting for my children. I was coaching them up to be sinful. 
Another way that I was coaching my children to be sinful is by yelling. I was a yeller. Veins popping out of my neck, using all three of their names. As a yeller, here's what I was teaching my children. You don't have to do what I say when I say it. You have to do it somewhere between the time I say it the first time and the time I get so frustrated that the veins pop out and you hear all three of your names. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. You're teaching sin if you're a yeller. You're training children in sin. And you're teaching them that you don't mean what you say when you say it. You only mean it when you get mad enough to scream. Fathers, here's what I also learned. By being a yeller, I was not only training my children in sin, but I was undermining my wife's authority in the home. Why? Because I am big and scary and I have a big voice. And if I use my voice to intimidate my children, my wife can't. So they respect me more than they respect her. It's not rocket science, people. Just stop yelling. And as a matter of fact, I lower my voice when I give my children instructions. I don't want them to obey me because I yell. I want them to obey me because I'm dad. You hearing this, folks? I want them to sit around playing going, Whoa, wait a minute, did daddy just whisper something to us? All children are trained. They're trained well or they're trained poorly, but they're all trained. And I used to train mine in sin. I know none of you ever did any of that. But I just needed some confession. And I appreciate you for bearing with me while I just sort of, you know, let that out there right there, okay? So do what you're told when you're told with a respectful attitude. What, the respectful attitude. So wait a minute, what if I tell them what to do when they do it, but they roll their eyes and they cluck the tongue and they smack the lips and they sigh and <sighs> slam doors and all that. They're, they're doing it, right? Yeah, they are doing it, but they're also violating the fifth commandment. And if we allow our children to roll the eyes and cluck the teeth, smack the lips, and we do not correct it every time, we are coaching them in sin. Yeah, but those are just the teen years. no. Last time I read my Bible, there is no period of life where sin is acceptable. It's sin, and it has to be corrected. It is not acceptable for a child to roll eyes, cluck tongues, smack teeth. It is not acceptable for a child to slam doors. It is not acceptable for a child to huff and puff when they are told something to do by a parent. It is not acceptable. It is sin, plain and simple. And if we are not correcting it, we are training our children and driving them deeper into that sin. And we've got to get this early. If we don't, here's what happens. They're 14, 15, 16 years old, and they're looking eye to eye and going word for word. They're embarrassing us in public. They're embarrassing us in private. We don't like them. We don't want to be around them. We can't wait till they get 16 and get car keys so they can just be gone. We love the youth group, not because of what they teach, just because we're not having to do it. We want them away from us. Why? Because they're beasts. And we think it's because they've reached a certain age. Nope. That's because that little thing that was in them, you let grow up. How do we get rid of that? Discipline and training. Early in life. Discipline, that's the easy part. Just read Proverbs. Spank their behind. Yeah, but I just don't believe in spanking. Then you don't believe the Bible. That's what the Bible teaches. Does Dr. Phil teach that? Nope. Dr. Spark teach that? Nope. Dr. Jesus does. (laughs) Amen? So, The Bible says folly or rebellion is bound up in the heart of a child and time out will drive it far from them. (laughs) Folly is bound up in the heart of the child and removing some TV time will drive it far from them. No, folly is bound up in the heart of the child and the rod of correction, that's the only instrument God gives us to drive out the folly and rebellion in our children. And if we're not willing to use that instrument, the Bible says we're not willing to correct our child with the rod, we hate the child. Wait a minute. No, I don't want to do that because I don't hate my child. I don't want to do that to my child. I love my child. I wouldn't want to strike my child. You know what it sounds like? Mom rushes into the emergency room. Child is gasping, changing colors. He was bitten by a snake. Here's the snake. Oh, if they were bitten by that snake, this is the antivenom. You going to stick that in my baby? Yeah, I'm going to stick this in your baby. 
That will hurt my baby. Listen, ma'am, if I don't stick this in your baby, your baby's going to die. Well, I don't want you to hurt my baby. Ma'am, if I do not stick this needle into your baby, your baby will die. Well, no, because I love my baby too much to let you hurt them with that needle. The Bible says they have a disease and there's one antivenom. If you won't give them the antivenom, then you're saying you're okay with the disease taking them out. There's another side of the coin. There's the discipline and correction and the training. Here's where we fall short. And whenever we come up against frustration with our children, we realize we're missing it on the training aspect. Training is coaching the children to do what we expect them to do, teaching them how to do it. You know, coach, you know, the football coach down at UNLV, he's not going to walk out there when camp starts and says, y'all run this play. Never told them what the play is, never told them where they're supposed to be, how they're supposed to line up. Y'all just run this play. They don't do it right, you just dive on them because they didn't do it right. Who teaches like that? No. Let me give you a prime example. The shy kid. The shy, in quotes, kid. It happens all the time. I come up to somebody and, hey, how you doing? And, hey, uh, Johnny, this is Pastor Vody. Say hi to Pastor Vody. And Johnny doesn't do it. Johnny hides behind the leg. Here's what our culture says Pastor Vody's supposed to do right now. Pastor Vody's supposed to say, oh, that's okay. Nope. Because Johnny is in sin and it's not okay. I refuse to say it's okay. You just told Johnny something to do and he didn't do it. I'm not going to excuse it. I'm going to stand there until you correct Johnny. And you just have to look at me and be embarrassed and uncomfortable. But I'm not going to justify Johnny's sin. But here's what you can do to help Johnny. Train Johnny. So on Saturday, before you go to church on Sunday, you say, Johnny, tomorrow we're going to go to church. And, you know, we meet people at church. And I know you just, you're uncomfortable with that a little bit. So we're going to practice. And you get everybody together. And here's what I want you to do, Johnny. Three real simple things. I'm going to say hi, and you're going to look me in the eye, number one. You're going to grab my hand and shake it firmly, number two. And you're going to say, hi, my name is Johnny. Can you tell me those again? And he repeats them to you. And then you do them. And then you do it over and over and over again, 15, 20 times. Every time he does it, you hug him, you kiss him, you give high fives. You talk about how good he's doing, how excited you are. That's awesome, and tomorrow's going to be incredible. Johnny can't wait to get to church. In fact, Johnny will stand next to you when somebody approaches, and he will elbow you like, let's do it, let's do it. And then Johnny does it. He may not get them all in the right order. He's going to reach for the hand first. Oh, I'm supposed to look in the eye. Then he looks up in the eye and then he, you know, but he does it. And then you get down on Johnny's level and you look him in the eye and you kiss him all over his face and you give him high fives and you say, I knew you could do it. And then Johnny goes, let's do it again. <laughs> That's training. You don't just dive on Johnny for stuff. Train Johnny, teach him how to do what you expect him to do. Now he knows what's required of him. And everybody's clear and on the same page. Does that make sense? Yes. That's training, folks. And so we have a healthy balance between training and correction. All right? And by the way, the correction goes a lot better when there's training. Because now Johnny doesn't do what you told him to do. He knows he's going to be corrected because he knows exactly where he missed the mark. He rebelled. He knows he rebelled. He didn't feel like doing it. He knows what's coming next. I'm no longer the bad guy. Second phase. Catechism phase. Oh, man. Okay. Um, catechism phase. Ca catechism phase. Teach children what to believe and why to believe it. This happens as soon as their children become verbal. We start teaching them what to believe and why to believe it. They're little sponges. Two, three, four years old. And it's like, you remember the, the, the commercial, you know, for the toothbrush where they flip the guy's head back and his teeth are all in the way. You know, you think about that. You, your kid, you flip their head back and you just pour doctrine and theology in. Yes, but they don't understand that. Trust me. They understand more than you think. Yeah. And even if they don't understand it, just make them memorize it. Well, I just, yeah, but that would just be rote memorization. I don't want my children to think about God through rote memorization. Really? L let's just switch it up a little bit. How about the times tables? Well, I don't want them to learn the timetables through rope memorization. Isn't that interesting? We don't say that. We go, learn your times table. Alphabet. Do they understand the alphabet when you teach it to them? Nope. Rope memorization. Why is it that rope memorization is okay for the alphabet and for the times tables, but when we come to the Word of God, we're afraid of rope memorization? Pour it in there. And when you think they can't take any more, pour some more. We use the catechism, we specifically use the children's catechism when they're smaller, you know. Catechism is just learning doctrine and theology through a series of questions and answers. 
The most famous catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, most everybody knows. Question one in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's catechism. You've probably heard that before. You didn't know it was catechism. Children's catechism builds up to that. And so when they're two and three years old, who made you? God made me. And what else did God make? God made all things. And why did God make you in all things? For His glory. And how can you glorify God? By loving Him, doing what He commands. And why ought you to glorify God? Because He made me and takes care of me. Are there more gods than one? There is only one God. And how many persons does the one God exist? In three persons. And who are they? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Can you see God? No, I cannot see God, but He always sees me. <laughs> They're learning doctrine and theology through a series of questions and answers. Do they get it all? No. They don't get it all. Do they get the alphabet? No. But eventually something clicks and they start putting it together and they can read. Same thing in doctrine and theology. Yes, but you know, I don't want to force religion on my children. I just want them to, you know, when they're older, I want them to be able to decide for themselves if they want to be a religious person. Really? Let's try our exercise again. Now, take religion out and put education there. I don't want to force education on my children. I want them to wait until later in life and decide whether or not they want to be an educated person. How ridiculous does that sound, folks? By the way, if you're not forcing religion on your children, you're teaching them that it's not important. So you are training them away from God and not toward God. Catechism phase. Learn what to believe and why to believe it. Third phase, the discipleship phase. This happens when they enter into manhood and womanhood. By the way, from a biblical perspective, you enter into manhood and womanhood 12, 13. Okay? There's another level of expectation for you when you reach that age. And that's when we take them by the hand. I've got your attention. You've learned how to do what I say, when I say it, and with a respectful attitude. And because of that, by the way, there's more harmony in our home. And a lot of people think about the first phase, you know. I just, that just seems so harsh. It just seems so mean. But people who don't train, discipline, and correct their kids can't stand them. They don't even want to be around them. They're tired all the time because the kids are completely out of control. And they certainly don't want any more kids because it's killing them. But have you ever noticed this? Nobody ever says it, but it's as true as the day is long. Adults like well-behaved children better than non-well-behaved children. And so all of a sudden, the kids whose parents are so hard on them, they get more attention and more praise, and they are liked more by adults. The little monsters, people will smile at them politely, but do not want to be around them. Why should they? Mom and dad don't even want to be around them. And so we've taken care of phase one, and you're a respectful, obedient person. We've taken care of phase two. You understand doctrine and theology. Now give me your hand and walk with me, and I will show you how this is lived out in the real world. That's what happens in the discipleship phase. For our family, we have the incredible privilege of, we're a homeschool family. We educate our children at home. We decided when our sons came to a certain age that dad would become their primary teacher. Mom turns over all that stuff, and dad's the teacher. I travel about eight days a month. My oldest son travels with me full time. He is my personal assistant. Um, he, he handles, you know, my, my resources on the road. Um, and, and we take our school and we do school on the road. And so I, I, I am his teacher. More importantly than that, I'm his mentor and I'm discipling him. And I'm teaching him what it means to be a godly man. And I'm teaching him what it means to be a priest, prophet, provider, and protector who will one day stand as captain of his own ship. I'm passing that on to him one day at a time. Sometimes through doing things very well. Sometimes through doing things very poorly. In one instance, I'll never forget. It's our last service. Can I have a couple of minutes? Okay. I'm at an event way down south, and this guy comes up to me, and he basically is he's arguing with me, basically almost picking a fight. He's disagreeing with something on no basis whatsoever. He's one of these kind of know-it-all guys who's read, you know, a paragraph on theology and thinks he knows everything. And he's challenged, and I'm answering his questions. He's wrong. He's as wrong, just as wrong as wrong can be. 
And I answer his question and he asks it four or five different ways. His friends are even beginning to look at him like, dude, you're wrong. He answered you, you know. He's not even looking at me when he's talking. Well, would you say, you know, he gets all in my grill and one thing leads to another. And at one point, I say to him, you know what, you're being incredibly disrespectful right now. And I think I'm going to end this conversation. Out of nowhere. Oh, because a white man challenges a black man, I'm being disrespectful. And I said, brother, I don't know where you found that race card that you just played, but it um, wasn't called for. He said, I know how sensitive you people are. I said, you people? You mean tall people? You mean people who outweigh you by about 75 pounds? His friends, by the way, when he says that, back up. All of them, you know, they back up. And I look at him and I say, Sir, this conversation is now officially over. And we turn and we walk away. My 14-year-old son, he's 13 then, my 13-year-old son and I go back to our hotel. By the way, people came up to us afterwards apologizing just profusely on behalf of this guy. He's a hothead, he's this, he's that, he's the other. I said, man, don't worry about it. We're just, we're going to get out of here. We go home. Trey doesn't say anything on the way back to the hotel. We get back to the hotel. My 13-year-old son says, Dad, Dad, why was that guy acting like that? Does he not know that you could crush him? I said, yes, son, he knows that I could crush him, but if I do, I lose all credibility. He was provoking me, son. He said, Dad, did you want to crush him? I said, oh, yeah, I want to crush him. He said, Dad, I kind of wish you would have. But... I've never been prouder of you. My son can't learn that in a book. He learned that by my side. On one of the hardest days in my life recently. And sometimes he learns when I blow it. Like today, I said to him, son, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I acted like that in front of you. Come with me. Where are we going? We're going back down to the counter. And we go back down to the counter where the lady had just messed up our reservation beyond recognition. Made us have to go to another hotel because they didn't have a room at that hotel because of a mistake that they made. And I had to walk down there with my son right by my side and say, Ma'am, I need to apologize to you. I was short with you. I should not have spoken to you that way. Would you please forgive me for any disrespect that I showed you? You see, when I blow it, I'm still saying, give me your hand. And not, not just information out there somewhere. But walk with me while I show you what it means to live in accordance with the things that I've taught you to believe. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Fathers. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Look them in the eye and say, give me your attention. Give me your mind. Give me your hand. Because God has entrusted you to me. And it's my job to raise you and to train you and to teach you and one day to launch you as a missile from my silo for the sake of the kingdom of God to carry on the work long after I am gone. Amen. Amen.